Hey guys, you wanna go to the airport? Let's go. I don't have a good motto. You guys got bags? Let's go. I don't know if I'm capable of changing the world. You guys like airplanes? Let's go. But I don't wanna be defined by what I did 10 years ago. On a small stage or a national stage, you need to remember that you represent who you used to be as well, whether you want to or not. That's that, that's the Navy SEAL. That's Andy the SEAL. Will you shut the f up? <laughs> My name is Andy Stump and I was in the Navy from August of 96 until June of 2013. I knew I wanted to be a SEAL since I was about 11 or 12. That's like the 80s. Good luck trying to find information about that occupation. First off, we're post-Vietnam. Mogadishu, where there were a couple SEALs that were there in a sniper capacity. Panama, Grenada, and that's it. Super limited information. I had no idea of what operationally the job would be like. It was it was like a concept. I could find books in the library, and like the most common book SEALs read is Men with Green Faces. I'm like, okay, that sounds f badass. You're wearing Levi's with like a camo top and painted faces, and you're just bringing the heat to the enemy. That sounds amazing. I would like two of those. The movie Navy SEALs with Charlie Sheen. Got nothing on Starlight. Switching to thermal. I have watched that a few hundred times before I joined. One day I came home and I was like, hey, mom and dad, I'm 17. We're gonna be joined today at this meeting with a naval recruiter and I need your signatures. <laughs> Immediately you will be a casualty and you're doing us no good. We have to put you in an old pine box because you didn't use your noodles. There's aspects of buds that sucked for sure. Like I've definitely never been that cold up until that point in my life. And I was hungrier and, you know, physically more exhausted. But every time you get to one of those thresholds, you realize that it's not your body holding you back. You realize that you have a choice. You're not gonna have the best performance of your life, but you don't have to stop. And if you push yourself to that limit and you realize you can keep moving it and moving it and moving it, it strips away this thought that like, I'm not good enough. I can't do this. And it, it replaces it with this thought of, well, I'm just gonna keep going and we'll see how it goes. That's probably the most impactful thing that has stuck with me my entire life. These men are members of one of the most unique military organizations in history. Behind these green faces are men who have accepted the challenge of some of the most daring assignments given to American fighting men. These are the Navy's SEALs. I joined the Navy in August of 96. They break the classes down into summer classes and winter classes, and by that, what they mean was what month was your Hell Week in? Summer Hell Week classes have about a 75% attrition rate. Winter ones, it's like 80 to 90th percentile because it's f***ing cold. So unfortunately, I went through in a winter class, which I had no control of. That's just when the math churned me out. I did two pre-9-11 deployments there, screened for a development group. Shortly after 9-11, Moved out to the East Coast and went through selection in 2002. Stayed there until about mid-2006. Came back as a BUDS instructor. You guys want to count individually or as a team? And in the Navy, at least, the big jump is from E6 to E7. So you're a petty officer, first class, and the big jump, you change uniforms, is to a chief petty officer. And you have to have a mandatory career wicket. Without that wicket, at the E7 level, your record goes in front of a board of other E7s, E8s, and E9s. And the first thing they look for is, do you have this criteria met? Then they'll start looking at like your operational history, your awards, and all those things. And I was on my LPO tour when I got shot on deployment in Iraq. And because I did not complete enough calendar days, they counted it as incomplete. So I submitted my package two years, and I wasn't getting picked up. And finally, I was able to get a hold of somebody who was at the board. And they're not supposed to say anything because it's the community rating the community. The guy goes, dude, I saw your record. And they looked at it for five seconds and swept it off the table because it didn't have the LPO block complete. So I would have had to wait three more years if I had even been at that command long enough to even start my LPO position, to do it for two years, to submit my package again. And I'm not good at math, but that's five total years. So I said, no, I'm not gonna do this. And I started researching programs and I found a commissioning program that didn't require a college degree, which was the limited duty officer program. And it was the warrant program as well, it's the same package. And they had never had an E6 get picked up. And I was like, well, screw it, I'm gonna try. So I put my package together, did the interviews, put the package in, and I was the number one selection for 2008. On September 31st, I was an E6. On October 1st, I was an officer. And I walked over to the exchange, and I was like, do any of you women know which uniforms I need, and also how do I put this on? Because I received no additional training of any kind. <laughs> <laughs> Went back to uh, Team 3 as the training officer, and ended up being put into an operational billet for that deployment in 2010. Came back from that and was the operations officer at the training detachment or the training command that oversees all SEAL training for all the teams getting ready to deploy and got medically retired out of that command. 
So I knew that it was very likely that I was gonna be medically retired. The light at the end of the tunnel of the military, it was right in front of me. And I had been messing around working on the weekends for CrossFit teaching seminars. And I just took that opportunity to on-ramp what I was doing with that company as my military service was coming down. Working for CrossFit, I was sitting at the table when we were negotiating their first deal with Reebok, managing all of the licensing and sponsorship deals that they had. And then it was after I quit that job that I started going much deeper into the skydiving world. I loved skydiving from the first time I exited an aircraft back in 99, I think was my first jump. I went there with zero air qualifications and then was able to achieve every military air qualification that exists within a year. In a course of two months, I went static line jump master, directly to free fall jump master, directly to AFF, directly to tandem. I had a good 60 days and just dove into it. I never thought I would be able to make a living at it. The daredevil behind me taking a leap, breaking records while managing not to break any bones. I met Baker through Killcliff, and we're sitting at a bar. The idea of fundraising came up because Killcliff, for every can that they sell, a portion goes to the Navy SEAL Foundation. So that's how the conversation started. He's talking about wingsuit jumping, and he's like, well, why don't you do something like that and try to raise some money? Mind you, while having this conversation, I had never put a wingsuit on. And then I agreed to do it there at that point. I'm like, yes. I found a mentor who eventually taught me how to base jump and combined all of those things and took an airplane up to 36,500 feet and jumped out of it in a wingsuit and went like 18.25 miles over the ground. This huge interview, retired Navy SEALs and Legacy Expeditions co-founders. Welcome guys, congratulations. And this falls back to the wingsuit thing. Like, why did I do that? When it comes to raising money, you have to do something to get people's attention. Seven jumps and seven continents in seven days. With the goal of getting people's attention, so hopefully we can lateral that to raise money for Folds of Honor, which is around educational scholarships for children and spouses of those left behind, first responder or military world. We planned for 18 months, started in Antarctica, jumped there and then continued on and we executed our plan. The only thing that matters is the people that we were jumping for. And I can't speak for any of you, but I wanna live a worthwhile life and a full life and just fill it to the brim. And I think the best way that I can do that is to constantly remember that the people that we were jumping for gave up their today and every one of their tomorrows so we could be out here doing stuff like this. People need to know how Navy SEALs react to things. If you want me to review something, I will review it. I will. I got introduced to a guy named Tate Fletcher. We did a very specific podcast for the CrossFit world. And Tate afterwards goes, you know what? Let me introduce you to a buddy of mine because I think we can get some more donations for what it is you're trying to do. So he introduced me to Brian Cowan and Brendan Schaub on The Fighter and the Kid. I did their podcast and Cowan goes, hey, we need to get you on Rogan's podcast. And I'm like, whatever. I didn't know that you were involved in the rescue of Jessica Lynch. That was the second target that we hit in the first invasion of Iraq. To me at that point, Joe was the fear factor guy. I had never listened to his podcast. Sit down, do the podcast, had no idea the size and scale and scope of Joe's podcast and said some things that irritated some people. Like, what should we do with everybody in Guantanamo Bay? And I said, we should just shoot them. Controversial. <laughs> so the second time I went on Joe's podcast, we were kind of hanging out afterwards and he goes, you know, you should think about starting a podcast. And my initial reaction was, why the f would I do that? One of my theories in life is, when you're exposed to people that are more successful than you or smarter than you, you should probably take their advice if they take the time to give it to you. The guy who has the most powerful podcast platform on the face of the planet is suggesting that you start one on your own. What's the downside? And that's where it started. You know, my governing principles for the podcast is that I refuse to try to portray myself as anything that I'm not. Be yourself, tell the truth, be honest about what you don't know. And more than anything, what I've found in the podcast is I've learned more about myself because it questions my beliefs. Why do I believe what I believe? Can I articulate why I believe this? And am I open to having my mind changed? Like the podcast is the most rewarding thing that I do for myself. I'm glad that I have the chance to have these conversations. The fact that there's a microphone and a camera there, it's kind of just like a side aspect. I'll be honest with you, to me there is not Black Rifle Coffee, it's Evan. My favorite thing about the brand is Evan and my relationship with him and my desire to stay involved with the brand and move the needle forward in every way that I can comes from that personal relationship. Fortuitous timing and luck definitely plays a part in this. Evan just happened to be talking about their franchising model and opening up outposts. So I was like, hey, can I have one of those? He goes, yes, you can. Go, okay, cool. And the smartest thing I ever did was had him sign that contract right there. <laughs> I wanted to solve a problem where I live and create something that I would want to hang out in, what I would want it to be, with Evan's blessing, and that's what we did. We like to hunt, we like outdoor adventure, and we like coffee, and we like to run our mouths and talk a lot of shit. 
how could we not like each other, really? He's a more articulate version of myself. No, he's, he's a more articulate, more handsome, taller version of me. More articulate, smarter, more handsome version of myself. So basically, he's not me. He's just a more handsome, smarter version of himself. He makes everything look easy. I'm gonna go be a SEAL Team 6 guy. I'm gonna go be a commercial pilot. I'm gonna go set some world records. I'm gonna start a successful podcast. He just makes it all look easy. He's creating a lot of value. I think by enhancing the culture and then leading, you have to pull those types of people into the company and then you have to put your resources behind them so they continue to affect others around them. Consider myself to be extremely ordinary. What is unique about me is the people that I was surrounded by. I have to remind myself sometimes that I am a vet. And I don't know if that makes sense. And I think it's really healthy that I'll go a really long period of time, occasionally, not even remotely giving a f about what we used to do. And I'm really thankful for that experience, but I don't wanna be defined by what I did 10 years ago. It's really easy to only point the highlights out or you know, round some edges on things that people might not be comfortable with. And I don't think we should do that. I think there's some gnarly things that come from a life that we used to live, whether it's brain damage or the moral and psychological weight of living in an occupation where you're deciding whether or not you're gonna take another human being's life. There's nothing wrong with talking about that stuff. I think where it gets to the place of being wrong is when you ignore it and pretend that it doesn't exist. So I think our obligation and BRCC's obligation is to tell the whole truth, to paint the whole picture and celebrate the things that are awesome, acknowledge the things that you know, could be done better and then provide actionable steps beyond that. Like, hey, these are things that we can actually do. I mean, what, what else could you possibly ask more than just doing that? And it's one of the things I love about Ebony's super creative. It's like, dude, we should do a cleared hot blend of coffee. And it's a blend of AK-47 and Silencer Smooth, which are the two of my favorite blends. It comes in ground only. It is the single best mix that I have found for cold brew. Holy cow, it will knock your socks off in all the best ways. It's the perfect collaboration.